This is the Fix Your Punk Podcast, the podcast that's here to tell you work sucks, I know. I'm Grayson Peltier. Um, Today's episode is going to be focused on remote work and flexibility in the workplace and a continuation of some of the discussion I had a few episodes ago about the norms of the workplace, but focusing on specifically remote work and the high demand for remote work and why employers are trying to push people to return to the office um, in spite of it actually being a more logical choice to keep people remote on a financial and on a personnel level and on a social justice level as well. Um, And discuss some of the, the interesting idiosyncrasies that are produced by the current nature of how workplaces are governed that actually drag down the business's ability to perform well, to do good for society, and even to make a profit based upon certain biases and ideas that people in management, people in power, and even people with capital have so ingrained in their minds that are causing effects on society but are also not even serving them, which is very, very ironic, but it's very true. And also I want to discuss the implications of this shift away from remote work, which is starting to happen. Still, there's a lot more remote work now than there was before, but there are some pretty serious implications here. And there is a large demographic of people who have been able to do exceptionally good work, who have been able to perform great in their jobs and be able to contribute significantly to their company and to... Um, and to society as a whole because some of those barriers have been lifted and people are accepting the inclusion of people who need remote work for whatever reason. We're talking people who um, are stay-at-home moms. We're talking people with disabilities, older people with health issues as well. And the thing is, is that these workplace conditions When we elevate the conditions of people in the workplace and we make it easier for people to participate in the workforce, we are increasing not only their economic mobility, but we're also increasing longevity and health at the same time. And some of these artificially constructed barriers are in fact deliberately there just to punish and hold those things down. Um, I saw a shocking statistic Um, two, Two in five Americans would rather die young than live in poverty. And a lot of the people who are going to be affected by living in poverty are people who are either disabled or older. And that maybe, maybe they, at a time in their life, they had a lot of skills. Maybe they went to school, they had experience in the workplace, something happened. And now because they can't show up to the office, because they can't, follow the normal schedule, follow all the regu- all, all of the office culture norms, even though they can contribute quite a bit, they're not able to um, produce economically. And this is a situation that people just don't want to be in. And that is, that's a very, very serious statistic here that we have to think about. We have to think about when we're making these decisions, these choices in society, are we driving people so insane that they are going to have deaths of despair. And that's just a general phenomenon. But I thought I'd bring it up here because of the fact that that remote work has helped a lot of older people. It's also helped younger people too. And that is something that a Business Insider article kind of made a point trying to say, well, all of your Gen Z workers are disengaged from the workplace and they're not making and they're not loving their jobs. They hate their jobs because of work from home, because they don't have the connection to the office culture that they once had. And honestly, that article is just completely ridiculous. All they're doing is they are putting out the corporate leaders' internal biases because there's actually a study by ZipRecruiter that found that 18 to 34 year olds would accept a pay cut between 16 to 18% in order to be able to work remotely. And my perspective as someone who falls in that age category 
is and was worked both remotely and on site is that it is basically just projection. It is what they want to be true. And I've had a theory about why, especially when it comes to younger workers, that bosses want them in the office. And that is because they want to feel a sense of control. Of course, you have commercial real estate stuff, but they want to feel a sense of control. They want to feel like part of it I've noticed in some of my jobs is that is that employers want to develop this closeness on a personal level with younger people because they think that they can almost act in a pseudo parental way to like guide them. But usually that's very pathological in the context of employment because employment is supposed to be it's supposed to be negotiated as a business transaction, not as like a parent or somebody who is who is like helping you and has an emotional relationship because that only serves just like the family thing we are we're a family at this company gaslighting thing um all that does is it seeks to cause the worker to devalue their labor and that is a major drag on them for no real benefit but i i just call it jobber theory really they want somebody to play to them these bosses they want somebody to play down to them then they want to then feel like they are more important because they have dominance and control over somebody else, all the while justifying it, saying that they're improving office culture or they're helping them to gain a better learning opportunity. It's just like the internships for exposure and and for experience, unpaid scam. That You're not paying them anything, but you're helping them to learn about some sort of industry or some sort of trade when in fact, probably the information you're giving them is bad and all you're doing is you're taking their labor for free. Um, and remote and moving people from working in the office to uh, from working at home to working in the office does have costs to the worker. I saw an estimate of like at least a thousand dollars a year or more, thousands of dollars a year, depending on how far you live and all of those things. So you're in fact, causing a, a material decrease in the economic well-being of your workers by forcing them to come back in. And like I said, this study showed that 18 to 34-year-olds would accept a pay cut of 16 to 18%. So you're literally costing your company money by holding to this model. And this is one example of why workplace democracy, co-determination, and even just unions can make a business more financially successful because not only do you get the benefits of having happier staff that really want to work there, um, you by implementing certain changes like this, you're actually saving the company money because you're no longer going based on the biases of management. Um, you're going based on consensus or at least you're adding in you're adding the additional voice of the worker to the process the people that are on the front lines and there are so many companies that don't listen to what they're hearing from the front lines from their workers and what their workers are hearing from their customers and i've seen it over and over and over again companies that are failing and what they're doing is they're just blaming the employees and thinking that they can just micromanage their way out of the problem the manager is just clinging on or the owner, usually these are owners who are quote unquote small business tyrants as Street Fight Radio discusses it. Um, they will cling on to the idea that they're right and that the problem is that their employees are screwing them over when in fact it's because their entire business model is messed up. And had they listened to these employees who genuinely want to help the customers, they genuinely want to do the right thing. They want to be helpful, but they're constrained by these company policies or these rules or the way they do business. And if they could make some changes and some adjustments, the company could become more sustainable. Um, and of course, the kinds of risks and, and investment risks and stuff like that that a company may take if you have more worker ownership and more of a democratic process in the workplace – um, the company may be more stable because some of those whims are controlled a little bit. Now, there is something to be said about entrepreneurship and risk-taking and having a high level of autonomy and building a creative enterprise, and that's something that I really talk about a lot and I believe in a lot. But in terms of certain types of financial risks, um, as well as listening to the feedback of those on the ground, 
something that's closer to a co-determination or a co-op is actually more stable. You've seen a lot of you've seen good financial results from many co-op businesses um, internationally. And these companies are successful and even lasting through recessions and depressions and things like that because they're because they're responsive to their workers, more responsive to their customers, and they're not taking ridiculous risks. Um, and you even have in terms of those, the types of risks and those types of feedback, you also have stuff like regulatory violations like the, the – Norfolk Southern, the train company, they're going to face a bunch of lawsuits and they're going to lose a lot of money over that. Or at least I hope they lose a lot of money over those lawsuits from the train derailment in East Palestine. And they've also had some other train derailments as well. And the unions were calling for better staffing and better safety measures. Had they implemented those, these derailments may not have happened. The railways would be safer. And the company wouldn't have to pay out in losses from a huge ecological disaster, not to mention the societal implications of disasters like that. So coming back to the issue of remote work itself, it's it could save the company money. And of course, there's the whole thing of commercial real estate, commercial leases and all of that. But you can at some point, you can get out of a lease. You can, can, you can sublease it. You can do th- all kinds of things with leases, and if you can start to let those leases expire, the company can actually start making more money, and there may be a competitive advantage to having a fully remote staff. In fact, if I were running a company with employees, and I've been involved in entrepreneurship and family businesses quite a bit, I would do as best as possible remote staff with flexible scheduling because you're going to get the service cheaper, you're going to get people who are happier and you're not going to have the commercial real estate overhead. Um, and maybe, maybe, maybe if they're not, you don't have managers that are self-serving or thinking about things other than the actual sustainability of the company, then those types of decisions will come about. And and unfortunately, though, the the, the trend is showing the opposite. There are a bunch of workers out there, and. This is a concern in terms of the dynamics of the labor force. There are a bunch of workers that are really demanding remote work. You have 60% of job seekers hoping to find remote work, according to a report from ADP. Um, And you have, unfortunately, according to um, LinkedIn, 14% of openings were remote as of December 2022 versus 20% last spring. So you have, when you hear a lot of like the nobody wants to work anymore, and of course a lot of that has to do with retail and service jobs that are not possible to do remotely, or at least not in the conventional way, not unless you're doing robots, you're doing the automation stuff, which is another consideration. Um, I was actually at a restaurant a few weeks ago, and they had um, these robot servers but there would still be a physical, like an actual human being server. The robot would just bring over the plates and the human being, the, the actual server, would put them on the table from the robot. And that's a big labor-saving thing. And I think that a lot of people would be more willing to work server jobs if they did that. Because I know for me in particular, I am dyspraxic, which means I'm clinically uncoordinated to a medically diagnosable level. I would never want to work a server job where I'm carrying around trays of of plates because I could easily drop them. So there you go. You're bringing more people into the workforce by leveraging automation. And of course, instead of using automation to completely replace workers, you can use it to help make workers' lives better and to um, and to improve workplace conditions. And that's one of the things that you can do with workplace democracy or a co-op or those types of models um, that you couldn't do without it. Um, But you hear, you you still hear nobody wants to work anymore. But you have all these people here who are definitely willing to work. In fact, my hypothesis is that there are people out there that are dying to work under the right conditions. People who would love to work even jobs that might be a bit crappy. 
if you're giving them the right conditions. If you're giving them, if you're doing like customer service and all that, there are lots of people who maybe would not, would never want to go in and work in a call center who would do that from home. And you own, and you have employers now rolling it back from 20% remote um, last spring to only 14% as of December. And it seems like it's going backward and backward and backward. And of course, the the super, super wealthy are like, okay, we're not going to change a, a gosh darn thing. Our solution is just that we're going to crash the economy with high interest rates and with overly constrictive fiscal policy and the threat of a default on the United States' debt through the politicians that we got elected instead of making the simple adjustments that would allow our workplace to be more appealing to those populations who desperately want to work. You have those you have people who are at the end of their lives who are who are in retirement who would rather who are saying they'd rather trade years of life rather than have to live in poverty or have a poor quality of life. Open up those opportunities and the people will come. And that is just not realized when you're not thinking through the lens of the worker. You have people out in the public um, who are who are willing to try anything in order to have a more flexible working arrangement. You have people out there, you have, it's been a thing for a very, very long time for stay-at-home moms, for uh, moms that that are married to a a spouse in the military, um, to join multi-level marketing companies and all kinds of like direct sales scams that are almost tantamount to pyramid schemes where they're paying money to work. They're losing money trying to get an opportunity to earn an income that's on a flexible schedule. And those people, they're they're out there. There are people who are slaving away trying to make a few dollars an hour. And I did this. I'm willing to admit that after I had my um, head injury and I was agoraphobic, too scared to leave the house, remote work was extremely, extremely scant. And I was doing this thing called Amazon Mechanical Turk, which probably netted me out to like three, four dollars an hour at most of like going through and doing like random like data, uh, data entry type stuff along with surveys. And people are, 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 are scavenging through the internet for these types of opportunities. Um, and especially people. Um, with disabilities or some kind of circumstance in their life, but also just people who need to supplement their income. You have you have people who maybe are in professional jobs that have that have gone through downturns. You have people who, ha- like me, I'm in the political field, so we have an extended off season sometimes, um, or my business isn't bringing in as much revenue, and. You have employers who are screaming, nobody wants to work anymore. Come apply here. Come in. Come now. And then when you come in the door to these employers, they're treating you like crap. So they did everything to try to get you in, but they won't do anything to keep you in there. And then they're saying, well, you have to have wide open availability all day long for however long our store is open from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., whatever it is, that's not going to be somebody who who needs like a part-time job is not going to have wide open availability every single day of the week. That's not that's not what you're paying for. And you could fill those slots if you fixed your scheduling methodologies. You could fill those slots, improve customer service, improve customer loyalty, and retention and all of that by staffing better and by allowing maybe somebody who has a professional background. And that's the thing is that, again, employers, they're looking for a jobber. They're looking for somebody who is ready to be exploited and manipulated that they can put under them, that they can pin under them and say, I have won over this person. And that attitude is not conducive to the success of the business. It is simply a bias that managers have developed over the years culturally. It is not an efficiency of econ- economics, really. 
is certainly not an efficiency of performance. We discussed that a few episodes ago that like these workplace cultures and specific work hours and methodologies of making sure that people work more hours instead of gauging based on actual productivity, it's not improving productivity in any way, shape, or form. You're just creating scared people. And you're making yourself feel better about yourself because you can control other people. So um, if you were to do that, and that's the thing is that is that the people... I heard somebody who was – I saw a story somebody online who was applying to like a part-time job at a movie theater and, and they got rejected and people online were saying it's probably because you listed the fact that you have a college degree on there. and I think they had like a, even a master's thing like that and they needed a stopgap measure in terms of income to tide them over to the next um, – Uh, to the next professional job and these employers are like no we don't want to take that person we want somebody that we can easily manipulate and exploit now i totally understand the thing about having people in their employee loyalty people will stay with you long term but if you open yourself up a little bit there are a lot of people who will look to working in your environment for a fair wage but for a little extra money not necessarily if you're not necessarily a full time if you have something where you only need somebody part time or you can even split for for the sake of people who have disabilities or for people who can't work the full number of hours because they're a stay at home parent if you can split a job into two part time roles instead of demanding that somebody be there 40 straight hours a week you can get a lot more labor in there and you can get workers in there that are going to be happy. You're paying them a fair wage. You're paying them a living wage as best possible while treating them well and understanding that these are people who need to not, uh, that need flexibility in their schedule and that aren't going to have open availability for you all the time. And a consortium of workers working together can self-organize and can determine this whereas a boss or a manager or somebody that's tied to a very rigid way of thinking will not think of these things um and there's proof that more people will go into the market for service jobs if you take away all of the manipulative controlling bullshit and i'm sorry that i swear that i swore on this podcast um if you take all that away then you will actually um, get people to do things that you wouldn't think of, like a delivery driver. You used to think of a pizza delivery driver or uh, or some sort of food delivery driver. That's that's a low wage job for low wage workers who are stuck in low wage work. But now you have Uber Eats, you have Grubhub, you have DoorDash. Because they made it super flexible where you can just turn on your app and turn off your app. You don't have to talk to some manager who's keeping you in some shift. Um, You get to have autonomy. You don't have to deal with that nagging voice talking to you. You don't have to um, deal with a specific schedule um, and you can earn tips. Obviously, these platforms are flawed. They're They're super flawed in terms of the economic aspects, the compensation aspects of it. Um, But the working conditions for even like an Amazon flex driver, there are people who are definitely willing to do that, but they would never dare step in and take, take a shift at their local McDonald's or their local um, non-union grocery store or their, um, or, or any Walmart or any, any of these retail places. And these are still considered like, lower end jobs but because we've made them even the job of taxi driver with uber no there are lots of people there were professional people out there that 10 15 years ago they're like no way i'd never be a taxi driver on the side at night but then in my neighborhood which is a fairly upscale part of town you have people coming around in mercedes benzes and teslas and bmws every once in a while that are picking up people on uber And because they have that sort of level of independence and autonomy and they have that and and they're not subjected to all of these workplace rules, they'll do it. Even though the pay, the pay for for Uber may wind up being less than they'd make working at Walmart when you factor in all the expenses. 
especially these people that are driving around in expensive cars. But because the schedules are flexible, because they feel more in control, because they don't feel like they're being manipulated by some crazy manager, then they will follow, they will go and they'll do those things. They'll go and they'll, and they'll ride somebody around. They'll go and they'll deliver food because they feel like this is something that they can do and that's open to them. And that the fact that the application process is open, they're not going to reject you for a, being an Uber driver because you have a college degree. They're not going to reject you from being a DoorDash driver um, because you had a professional job before that. Or, or that you're working one right now. So those are some things that, that we want to think about and think about the fact that the sort of intuitive flexibility of some of these uh, some of these apps has shown that there are people out there, there is a workforce that will do quote-unquote um, undesirable jobs if you make them more desirable. Um and then of course and then and then of course we're talking about the the whole issue of like these office jobs and stuff like that there are people out there with a lot of expertise there are there are, there are business owners that believe that they need to have a full-time employee to do a certain type of role there are there are people that feel like i need to have somebody in the office doing this work when really you don't you can oftentimes again save money by having somebody that's that 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 is working remotely on this, and maybe you can hire somebody for a role that you thought would require forty hours sitting at a desk. There may be somebody out there that has a disability that can't do like straight shifts like that. They have to take breaks in between. They have to they they have doctor's appointments during the day, um, but they can still deliver. They can still deliver and 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 they can do those jobs. Um, and they can do a very good job at them. But because of this bias that the employer has toward somebody sitting at a desk from 9 to 5 and this so-called office culture, which really is nothing more than a bunch of window dressing that employers are using to try to entice people to buy into their system, just trying to throw them a little care at behavioral incentives uh, or pizza party. But what they really want is they want to be respected. They want to be given conditions that they can work with, that work with their lives. And you can get the job done and treat people well. And your business will be more successful because you have treated people well. And you're not going to be understaffed all the time um, because you are able to bring in people that wouldn't have been brought in um, under the old under the old paradigm. And it's going to be a challenge. It's definitely it's mental. It's more of a mental block for these employers. I know that for sure, because they feel like they need to subordinate and they need to subjugate people of a lower class than them, even even those with a degree, like those fresh out of college. Some of these employers just feel like, oh yeah, I have to be there to watch over every single last move they make. Um, even in professional jobs, I've been in professional jobs where they track every single last thing you do on the computer and clock you out for breaks and all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you remove if you remove that bias, you start allowing things to work the way they are intended to. And the workers themselves, they know. Oftentimes the workers themselves know. That's why that whole show Undercover Boss succeeded for so long. Is the workers themselves know what the issues are on the ground. And they, they're passionate about it, and they want to help do the right thing. But they also want to be treated fairly and paid well. And a company that is successful because it's not guided by hubris, but rather by actual care for the product or service that that company is making, that company will be financially successful in order to support a full living wage, benefits, all of that stuff. And that's the vision that we have to work to, whether that is going to come through employers um, ceding to a union, um, if it's going to have to be fought for through unionization, um, if it's going to be done sort of through the slow burn trickle of people just deciding to not show up to work, even after they pull the recession card, even after they pull the um, the card of, of you have to come back to work at these lower rates because – 
um, all your money's running out and and we're not going to be giving out small business loans anymore so you can't really build this new future or build this new community that you want to do or you won't be able to do your thing you have to stay subjugated and enslaved to me the almighty super wealthy employer even after they pull that if people keep resisting and they're still not getting the people they want back into the workforce or they're getting them back in but they're going and they're filling out union cards at some point some employers are going to concede and definitely some have on this issue of remote work which is a major major milestone for inclusion and i cannot understate this for people with with disabilities for people um, with different life circumstances this is a massive milestone for inclusion. We went from 2% pre-pandemic, according to LinkedIn, to it was 20%. That's a tenfold increase. But now 14%. That's still a huge increase. It's like a sevenfold increase. And change is possible. And employers are going to try to resist it. And, and, and it's not because it's making them more successful. It's just that the people who are resisting it have more in the tank to continue to resist and to continue to fight their war and to fight their battles against the workers. It's not because bringing you back to the office is helping them financially. It's not because forced overtime is helping them financially. It is because they are already successful and their preferences get to take precedence. So when we are evening out the playing field a little bit with pe- with funding for cooperatives, funding for people to have their own businesses, p- economic security where people can go and say, I'm going to do my own thing, that starts to even that away and that is breaking down the preferences of the super wealthy elite incumbent, incumbent class. So that is what we have to keep an eye out for and we have to try our best to continue to keep going even though even if we're running on fumes and they are still loaded up. And it definitely seems like it's going to keep going. There's there's a successful union um, strike of teachers in Los Angeles um, and the school maintenance workers. It was really the maintenance workers and the cafeteria workers, all the other non-teaching employees that really got significant raises and and health care and all kinds of um, concessions out of the school district that really are a model for what good labor practices are and that that collective bargaining that collective leverage works and it's and it's continuing and that's the great news is this stuff is continuing howard schultz of starbucks was hauled before congress um that union drive is still continuing and people are still continuing to try to do stuff on their own um, outside of these places. That Even though now you're looking at the retail wages, you're looking at the crappy jobs, they're not begging as hard. Their wages are no longer like 17 18 an hour. They're maybe going down. You're not seeing the $20 an hour wages. You're seeing still $15, $16 an hour, at least here in California. Um but it's it's still it's still going on even with this recession even with this economic cloud coming over workers have already seen what is possible you can't put the genie back in the bottle workers have seen what is possible in terms of better treatment workers in professional jobs and um, office type jobs have seen what is possible with remote work and they are going to want it and if if they can withhold their labor or they can negotiate better collectively um, through unionization, through um, pre-union organizing, um, and just through the conditions of the market, then I think that we are going to come through this and still maintain some gains. And maybe at some point we will get to the point where these changes are as commonplace as that 40-hour work week. That 40-hour work week was a compromise created by unions. The fact that we're only working 40 hours a week, we're working five days a week instead of six days a week, that is because of the unions. And now a lot of employers are compromising and saying, okay, we'll let you do hybrid. You come into the office three days a week, but you get two days at home. Um, Or you get one day a week and four days at home. Um, 
And those compromises, those things that are starting to become somewhat more standard in professional jobs, those are fought through either through explicit organizing or through implicit, low-key, um, uncoordinated um, labor action, such as the simple unwillingness to accept office jobs that do not offer remote work. So there are lots of ways of pushing forth change, and hopefully we're going to continue to use them. Hopefully I've inspired you to continue to use them in whatever capacity you can. And please continue to come back here and learn more about this and other issues. Um, I also keep the TikTok well updated at FixerPunk, F-I-X-E-R-P-U-N-K, same on Instagram, at FixerPunk. And if you have a dilemma or a challenge from a workplace, some form of oppression, some kind of comment about something that you just want to get off your chest, um, maybe your boss is trying to force you back into the office, maybe you're considering organizing your workplace, um, whatever it is, even if it's just a rant or even if it's a more serious question for me about some kind of um, advocacy dilemma that you're going through in the workplace or with government or something that you want, an issue that you want to be talked about more, please call in. You can call the voicemail line anytime, 844-477-PUNK. That's 844-477-7865. It's a toll-free call. Call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Leave your comments on the show or any topics that you want to discuss. You can also reach out through the social media platforms or on email, Grayson, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N, at offspeedsolutions.com. Um, and I, you can also reach out on Twitter to at Grayson Nation, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N-N-A-T-I-O-N. I did get an Instagram direct message. Somebody asked me a question about homelessness and solutions for homeless people who um, are reluctant to accept assistance. And I will cover that on a future episode. So please do keep any questions coming, whether that's through social media, whether that's through email, or whether that is through the toll-free number at 844-477-PUNK. Um, I greatly appreciate that. Um, and please do join me again for the next episode. Thank you so much for spending some of your time with me today.